Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today here at First Baptist. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
may be seated. Sometimes I wonder, is he faithful? Does he see me in my trouble? Does he understand? Sometimes I question if he's able. Can he rescue? Can he save me again and again? But when I look back. Just one 
Welcome to the Sunday after Easter. I'm glad to be here. You're glad to be here because every Sunday's Easter Sunday at FBA. I, we serve a risen Savior. And you can tell it looks a little bit different in here today. We're going through Extreme Makeover Church Edition. And this, I'm very, it actually looks kind of like a theater in here with the drape behind me. And uh, we may install those permanently and put them on a motor, you know, so they just open and voila, there's the choir and orchestra. And, <laughs> but it's really, we're going to hopefully just have this arrangement through Labor Day. But I want to say how grateful I am that our orchestra and our choir are willing to, to be so flexible and adaptable. Jeff Cranfield. <laughs> and the choir is heading out. <clears throat> And our team has worked so hard uh, in conjunction with the contractor 
who is doing the demo on this wall and getting ready to reconfigure the, the choir loft and put in our new screen. It's an exciting time, and if you haven't walked out on, over here, there's a construction wall that comes out halfway into the corridor over here where the new coffee shop's going to be, so it's a great time to be here. If you are a first-time guest, we ask all first-time guests to send us a text message. Just use the word guest and send it to the number on the screen, and when we get your text, you get an immediate response from us in which we ask you to give us some information about yourself. We don't share it with anyone. We just want to know you better. And at the end of the service, we've got a gift bag for you in our overlook area, which is directly behind this room. It's a beautiful glass wall overlooking our lake. And there is a greeting team back there that would love to shake your hand, get to know you. But if you're in a hurry, just be sure you get the gift bag before you head out. I want to make a few announcements uh, coming up on our calendar. We've got a ladies' luncheon on Saturday, May the 4th. It starts at 12 o'clock, and our guest speaker is Whitney Caps, and she's going to do a phenomenal job. But uh, this women's luncheon always sells out fast, so I encourage you to log on and register for this. Ladies, if you're interested. And then I want to mention something very special, Christ in the Passover Seder. It's a fellowship meal in Faith Hall led by Pastor Paul Diamond, who is a Messianic believer in Yeshua, the Lord Jesus. And Pastor Paul Diamond was Dr. Stanley's personal assistant for about almost 30 years, and he's continued to serving in the office of the pastor now. But being a Jew who trusts in Christ now, he is able to bring the Passover to life as only a, a messianic follower of Jesus can do. So that, that really is an amazing experience if you've never attended a Seder meal for Passover. So you'll need to register for that on our website. I'm also excited to, to announce our 2024 parenting conference is coming up on April the 19th and 20th, and it starts on Friday night with a parent's night out with free child care as part of the conference. And you'll have a meal here with other parents who are doing what has to be the toughest job anybody has to do to raise kids in this crazy day and time. So we're very thankful to offer this, um, this opportunity for parents who need some encouragement and some tools to be the best you can be. And on Saturday at the conference, Dr. Tate Cockrell, who's a professor of counseling at Southeastern Seminary, in Wake Forest, North Carolina, will be the speaker for the sessions that day. So I encourage parents to sign up for this. If you know Christian parents that could benefit from this, share the link to our website, and they'll find the ad for it on our home page. Then we have a precious member of our church. I know her well. She and her husband have attended here for many, many years. But since COVID, uh, she has not been able to attend, and during the time that she's not been able to be here, her sweet husband passed away. This is Roger and Yvette Lakes, but Yvette, uh, on April the 1st, turned 91 years of age, and I just want us to wish her a very happy birthday. She's one of the sweetest people you would ever want to meet, and she's just not a, been able to come back since we reopened. But Yvette is watching. We love you, Miss Yvette, and we're so thankful that you had another awesome birthday. And just know your church family has not forgotten you. I think it's important when we can do things like that and acknowledge people who've been here for a long, long time. Well, we yes, that's right. <clears throat> Well, let's pray together if we can. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for that last song. There's nothing that you cannot do. You do things that defy our imagination. And you're capable of doing things we haven't even thought to ask you for. So we pray that you will build our faith through this time of worship and through the study of your word. We thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church, for this exciting new chapter that you're writing. We thank you for an awesome Easter Sunday and for 127 preschool babies. <laughs> Lord, thank you for what you're doing to bring young families here. And Lord, we pray that in this service, there's something you would have to say to every heart in life, not only for those right here in front of me and in this room, Lord, but for those who are watching and who will be watching all week long. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the generosity of your people who give and give and give so that we're able to do ministry and we don't ever have to think about how we'll do it or how we'll pay for it because your people are so generous. So we're just humbly thanking you for being the God of abundance and for blessing through your people and then blessing your people when they give. Father, we pray that today if there's someone who doesn't know Jesus, that something about a conversation they have, a smile they see, one of these awesome songs or something in the message will help them to understand now is the time to give their heart to Jesus. We pray that you would have your way here. Remove the obstacles, remove the distractions, and give us a spirit of surrender is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin? Jesus is called. is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ
In June of 2020, while most of the citizens of the world were under austere lockdown measures imposed by national governments and local municipalities, it did not prevent the annual gathering of global elitists at the Davos, Switzerland ski resort for the meeting of the World Economic Forum. And it was there in that June 2020 meeting of the World Economic Forum that the founder and president of that forum, Dr. Klaus Schwab, made the statement that the pandemic was a great time for the world to go through a global economic reset. And those who heard about that statement trounced upon it, especially conservatives. Not just conservatives, but even some libertarians and, and liberals were alarmed by the fact that such a gathering of powerful and wealthy and influential leaders would talk about such things at a time of such uncertainty and instability in the countries around the world during the COVID-19 onslaught. And so in the year after that, social media went crazy and conservative media went apoplectic in talking about what in the world does Schwab mean by the Great Reset. And there was an article that was posted on BBC Online in June of 2021, a year later. The title of the article was, What is the Great Reset? And How Did It Get Hijacked by Conspiracy Theories? That's interesting. If you don't like what people are saying, just dismiss them as conspiracy theorists. So the question is, where did it begin? The article says, like many popular conspiracy theories, this one starts with a grain of fact. <laughs> well, it certainly does. This forum was co-sponsored not only by the founder and head of the Davos Summit, but also by the Prince of Wales, who is now the King of England. And they launched this initiative calling for the pandemic to be seen as a chance to reset everything. And... Professor Schwab put it this way, and I quote, The pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, to reimagine, 
and to reset our world, to create a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future. So in the aftermath of everything that ensued from that type of language, the defenders of this notion of a reset attacked vilified and did all that they could to undermine any criticism whatsoever of this type of language and of the power that the elitist would seek to exert over the world uh, order and over the global economy. And um, people, because of that, grew more firm in their resolve to talk about it and to express their alarm over what all this would mean. And What's so fascinating about the Davos, Switzerland uh, gathering for the World Economic Forum is they get there to talk about global warming and human-caused climate change and how to devise mandates that can be imposed upon regular people like you and me to minimize our carbon footprint, and yet many of them fly to Davos every year on private jets which are probably melting glaciers every time one leads, leaves the runway. So when we think about the criticism that comes towards people who are leery of talk like a reset, leery of those who would seize upon the crisis of a pandemic to impose an agenda on people who are unsuspecting, the question of today's sermon in part one of this series is, is the global reset just a conspiracy theory? And I want you to turn to the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in a moment in verse 31. As we turn to Daniel, chapter 2, in our Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, there was a king named Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over the ancient kingdom of Babylon. And although he was indeed a pagan, someone who did not worship Yahweh, the true God, he was used by God to bring judgment upon God's people. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian forces invaded Israel in a successive series of campaigns, deporting the inhabitants of Israel into exile as prisoners and scattering them throughout his Babylonian empire, stripping them from their homeland, and even ransacking the holy temple of God in Jerusalem. There was a man named Daniel who, along with his three friends, were among the Jewish exiles in Babylon, and God gave Daniel the ability to interpret dreams. And one night, King Nebuchadnezzar had experienced what he would probably have described as a nightmare. And he called his magicians and astrologers and his interpreters of dreams, everyone who was on his payroll, into his cabinet room. And he said, guys, I've been rocked to the core. I've had this horrible nightmare And I need uh, to have you interpret it. And they were all like, tell us what it is. Tell us what it is. He said, no, because I'm not going to entrust you with this. The way I'll know that you can interpret it is if you can tell me what I dreamed first. And I think they all developed intestinal problems immediately. (laughs) Because he's not just asking them to interpret the dream he had. He's asking them to tell him the dream that only he knew he had had. So because none of them was able to do it, he started executing them. He put a death squad together, and they were dropping like flies. And the word got to Daniel and his friends that Nebuchadnezzar's on a tirade because none of the magicians and astrologers and interpreters can, first of all, tell him the dream he had, and secondly, tell him what his dream meant. And Daniel went home to the dorm, and he told his three friends, you know their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Medgo, said, guys... If God doesn't get on us and speak to my heart and show me what the king dreamed and what it means this time tomorrow, we're going to be with God. We're going to be dead. So he went home and he prayed and God gave him the secret. God showed Daniel the dream that the wicked king had had and he also gave Daniel the interpretation of the dream. And even though this happened 2,500 years ago, this dream revealed a series of global resets, including the one that you and I are preparing for now, and I might say we're even living through now, the global reset. 
So before we look at the verse, I want to give you point number one, which is this God foretold the global reset. God foretold it. It's part of Bible prophecy. And although we, if we wanted to, could take weeks looking at every prophecy about a global reset foretold in Scripture, we're focusing our attention on Daniel chapter 2. Daniel describes to the king the vision that the king had seen in his dream. And it was this huge statue, this image of a man of war, a warrior, whose different component parts consisted of pure metals except for his feet, which were metal and clay commingled. So in verse 31, he says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, you saw a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and his form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of, of clay. Now, if you stop there, all you know is God showed Daniel this image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. This man whose different parts consisted of these metals and of clay. That's the dream. But the king said, all right, can you imagine the look on the king's face when the king realized God really had spoken to Daniel and had revealed the image that he himself had seen in the nightmare. So Daniel begins to interpret the dream and says, the head on the warrior, which is a pure gold, Nebuchadnezzar, that head symbolizes you and your kingdom. But in verse 39, he goes on to say, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, which would be the chest and arms of silver. And then a third kingdom of bronze, that would be belly and thigh on the warrior, which shall rule over all the earth. And then verse 40, Daniel said, The fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, if our purpose was to do an in-depth look at Daniel today, and it's not, we would display that image and we would lay him down on his side because as Daniel is describing the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, he is depicting prophetically, futuristically, a linear timeline of the kingdoms that would follow the kingdom of Babylon. The successive kingdom to Babylon was that of Medo-Persia. And it makes sense because after the golden head was the chest and arms of silver, two arms, Medo-Persia, God demonstrated that beautifully. It would be this twofold kingdom united. And then the belly and uh, thighs of bronze would be Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. We know that now because we have the benefit of hindsight in history. Daniel didn't know that. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that. This image was a picture of prophecy. And then finally, the legs of iron would symbolize a coming global empire called Rome. In fact, Rome's armies were referred to as the Iron Legions of Rome. So it's fascinating that God foretold these things with this nightmare vision given to a king and subsequently revealed to Daniel as well as interpreted by Daniel. Now, we know that in history there were other shifts in global power prior to Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And we know there have been global resets in the time periods not addressed by this timeline in the image of the warrior. Resets are determined by wars and aggression, economic and cultural unrest, and a host of other factors. In fact, um, we are probably most familiar with the 20th century. Most of us in here were born in the 20th century. We've got some who were maybe born in the 21st. But we saw global reset time and again, particularly in the two world wars, did we not? The global order was reset because of the unrest on various continents, because of the rise of total totalitarianism, and then the way our country succeeded in defeating the Japanese and bringing an end to World War II and on and on we could go. But what we're talking about today, and for the purposes God was giving Daniel this vision to reveal to Nebuchadnezzar, we are talking about the shifting of world powers and the concentration of powers that will culminate in the final reset of all. 
That's the focus of not only today, but it's the focus of the series of messages. So if you look at the purity of the metals, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, it's only when you get to the feet with the ten toes that there is a commingling, a diluted strength of metal because the metal bits are commingled with clay, which means they cohere, but they do not have the strength to withstand undue pressure. And so in, uh, Daniel speaks about this in verse 42. He says, King, you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. So uh, I want to read that again since it's up on the screen now. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. So what is he talking about there? Well, if the legs of iron were the ancient Roman Empire, which was the empire in the days when Jesus came to earth, the empire in existence in the days of the writing in the New Testament and the spread of the, the uh, New Testament church, then the feet that are partly iron and partly clay, we know from later revelation, with ten toes, which symbolize ten kings, prophetic scholars, of which I don't claim to be, but I've subscribed to what they say, believe that those feet and toes represent a revival of the ancient Roman Empire in the last days. Some people refer to this image with its feet and toes of commingled clay and iron as a revived Roman Empire. Some have even called it the European Confederation of Nations in the last days. Some would argue that the European Union, which is already in place, is a precursor to this last days revived Roman Empire, which is why I was extremely interested when Great Britain exited from the European Union several years ago in what was called Brexit because they wanted to reclaim their sovereignty instead of assimilating into the European order of nations. And by the way, Sir Churchill probably rolled over in his grave multiple times when they became part of the European Union because he believed so adamantly in the superiority of the British Empire. He would have never believed in ceding the sovereignty of the British Empire to neighboring nation states on the continent. But such it was. I like to think of it this way that the feet and the toes on this image revealed in Daniel chapter 2 are what we could call the allied nations of the Antichrist. Because when you add this prophecy together with the prophecies of the New Testament, and in particular the book of Revelation, we know there's going to be a one world political leader who will emerge from among these European nations and whose charisma and charm and acumen as a leader is going to compel these nations to follow his leadership. In the book of Daniel, he's actually called the beast, which is a euphemism for a human being who will be this global world order leader. But if we can derive from the fact that the feet and the toes have the bits of iron in them, it makes sense that they would be an extension of the legs of iron, which are the Roman Empire, which is no more. And of course, if you look at the map of the ancient Roman Empire, it blankets Europe. So it stands to reason then that this new global alliance of nations under the Antichrist is going to arise from what might even literally be ten toes symbolizing ten world leaders out of whom the Antichrist is going to arise. Well, we don't have all of the blanks filled in as we talk about it today, but I am telling you what this means. I believe this will be a reset of consolidating nations, the power and resources and military might of those nations under the reign of a global leader who will rule the world from Europe. 
So that's what I believe, and that's why I tell you God has already foretold the global reset. So let's just say forget conspiracy theories. Let's just say some of the criticisms of the criticisms of Klaus Schwab and the Davos Summit and the predictions that this would be a time and the intentions that this would be a great time to seize upon global vulnerability in the aftermath of the pandemic. Let's just dismiss all of that like it never happened. The global reset is still prophesied by God and will take place. So we don't need QAnon and we don't need, uh, you know, we don't need people who've been sniffing and smoking and, and reading materials on the dark web to confirm for us a global reset is coming. God's already told us that. But here's the problem. Sometimes we Christians, we get so rattled when we see what's going on in the world. And one of the reasons why, if you don't know Bible prophecy, it'd be easy to get rattled. It'd be easy to lose your mind when you see what's going on. Because if you're like me, you wake up and think, what happened while I was asleep? I have awakened on a different planet. (laughs) Because we're surrounded by people who are crazy. We're, sur- we're talking about things, if you told me when I was 20 years old or even 10 years old, I would not have believed the kinds of things that we are talking about that we now normalize and accept as part of our lives. Is anybody besides me wondering where the Kool-Aid pump is? Where's the fountain that everybody's been drinking from? Because I feel like I'm on an island with, with, with very few people who see as I've been taught to see and believe as I've been taught to believe. So, it's part of the reset. But because we know prophecy, and more importantly, the God of prophecy, my second point is to remind you of this. God is sovereign over the global reset. Sovereign means he's all-powerful. Sovereign means he's ruling and reigning. And while he does not micromanage every detail of man's thoughts, he does not micromanage and force men and women to make the choices that they should make. He is providentially guiding and superintending the affairs of mankind to their foreordained end. He is still sovereign. I love the fact that God is sovereign. Because here's what I know. I'm not. I'm not in charge, and you're not in charge, and our president's not in charge, and and Professor Schwab's not in charge, and the elitists at Davos are not in charge, and Putin's not in charge, and hey, not even Satan's in charge. Almighty God is the only one who is in charge. And while each of these successive global resets from Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire to the Greek Empire under Alexander to the ancient Roman Empire and ultimately perhaps in our lifetime to the revival of the ancient Roman Empire with a Neo-Roman Empire with a European Confederation, even every one of those resets that has taken place and that has yet to take place, God is still ruling and reigning over the universe fully enthroned in heaven above. Our God is on his throne. So when Daniel went back to the dorm and said, God, please help. I need you to tell me what the king dreamed. And then I need you to tell me how to interpret it. The Bible says, if you'll skip back up to verse 19, it says, then the secret was revealed to Daniel. Did you see that? God gave it to him in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And before I read verse 20, I'm going to tell you something. This is a reminder to us that God answers prayer. Now, I've never asked God to tell me what somebody else dreamed. I don't want to know what nobody's dreamed. Amen. I don't want want to get inside anybody's dreams that they have at night. But, but, But this was a life or death situation. Daniel said, oh, heavenly Father, holy God, the king is requiring us to tell him what he dreamed. And what it means. Will you please show me what he saw? Let me hear what he heard. Let me feel what he felt so then I can go and tell him. And the secret was revealed. You know what Daniel did? He just praised God. Let me ask you a question. When God answers your prayers, do you praise him? I mean, really? Do you say, thank you, God of heaven. Thank you, my heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You've heard my cry and answered my prayer. Verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. And look what he says, wisdom and might are his. And God, 
You change the times and the seasons. You remove kings and you raise up kings. He said, my God gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. God answered Daniel's prayer. Daniel wrote it down. The Holy Spirit put it in the Bible and has preserved it throughout all generations. And now you and I are studying it 2024. You know it. The secret that was revealed to Daniel means it was no longer a secret. And because Daniel wrote it down and we're studying today, it's no longer a secret to us. You have the secret. Amen. You know how it's all going to end. So, no, it's not a conspiracy theory. The reset is on the way. And I'm so thankful that God is on his throne, ruling over earth. He has the fate of nations in his hands. God has decreed what will come to pass. And all the presidents, prime ministers, kings, tyrants, dictators, potentates, along with their wealth, power, prestige, and military might, are no match for the sovereign God of the universe. They're no match for God. I don't care how arrogant they are. I don't how, care how pompous they are. I don't care how cocky they are. I don't care about the little fat guy waddling around in North Korea threatening to blow everybody up. Uh, let me tell you something. That little doughboy is no match for Almighty God. He's no match. Psalm 47 says this, For God is the king of all the earth. How much is he king of? All the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. He sits on his holy throne. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over whom? Over all. Psalm 113 verse 4, The Lord Yahweh is high above how many nations? All. His glory above the heavens. Isaiah 40 and verse 17 says, All nations before him are as Nothing. And they are counted by him less than nothing. How do you become less than nothing? I mean, nothing's pretty low. All nations are counted as less than nothing and, and worthless. So what you and I have to remember, we may be living through the reset. We may get upset from time to time. But we must always remember who God is, where God is, and how he said all of this is going to end. Now, what can we expect from the global reset? Well, the global reset, first of all, takes power from nations, sovereign nations, and reassigns it to a council of global elitists. It's going to be a central committee. The reset is devised by those who make rules others must follow but never apply to them. Amen. It's true. The reset is for a new world order. And I'm talking about this next week. The reset cannot fulfill its objectives without seriously weakening the dominance, strength, power, and stability of the United States of America. In other words... If America is strong, the reset will never, ever fulfill its objectives. Therefore, it requires America to become weak. And do you know what we're witnessing? No enemy nation will strip us of our power. We are willingly handing it over day after day after day after day after day. We're giving it up. We are allowing enemies to overtake us while we look the other way. And we are asleep at the switch. And I do mean that literally. <laughs> I'm telling you, the reset will lead to the erosion of nationalism in favor of globalism. This global reset is one in which the love of one's country will give way to a form of global patriotism. Well, I'm here to tell you I love the Lord Jesus Christ, but I am thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. I really am. I pledge allegiance to our flag, and I do not care to be a global citizen. 
I have loved ones who fought and died to give me the freedom to stand up here and say what I'm saying. I'm thankful to be an American. And when we swear our allegiance to a global order, you will know that the reset button has been fully activated. This reset, by the way, I happen to believe is being impelled by a sick, weakened, impotent form of Christian evangelicalism that has sold its soul to the spirit of the age. A Christian church that has stopped preaching the Bible because it cares more about appeasing people who've drunk the Kool-Aid. We must have a return to Bible preaching. Bible preaching. And this is one of the biggest problems that I have as an evangelical. I don't run into problem with global elitists. I run into people who claim to be like me. The people who've been most critical of me haven't been the elitists. They've been people who even call themselves my Baptist friends, who are no friends at all. I have a lot of Baptist friends, but I have a lot of Baptist enemies who have it out to, to destroy and steal and kill. And I happen to believe the enemy can simply weave his way into those who profess to know Christ. There's a separation of the wheat and the chaff that the reset will force. And let me tell you something, you will know them by their fruits. The reset is coming. Let me tell you, here are the signs that the reset is underway. And that's, by the way, that's one of the reasons why I don't like, I like calling myself a Bible-believing Christian. I've got people that I love who know Jesus, who are Pentecostal, who are Methodist, who are Presbyterian, who are, who are independent, interdenominational, co-denominational, non-denominational, anti-denominational. As long as they know Jesus and believe the Bible, you're my brother and you're my sister. But the reset is underway. This reset is a reset. I'd like to give you some characteristics. It's a reset from individualism to collectivism. What is collectivism? Collectivism is the notion that we should elevate the good of society over the dignity and autonomy of the individual person. In other words, all of us should make sacrifices for the common good. It's really the backdoor mantra of communism. The reset is from critical thinking where we're taught to analyze and dissect and, and break apart arguments and philosophies. It's a reset from critical thinking to artificial intelligence where someone else thinks for you. It's a reset from the freedom of thought to intellectual coercion. It's a reset from academic freedom in the halls of higher education to the suppression of alternate views. It's a reset from prosecuting wrong actions to prosecuting wrong thinking. Thought crimes. That's where we're headed. It's a reset from capitalism to socialism. It's a reset from energy abundance to energy rationing. It is a reset from the logical consumption of Earth's natural resources to delusional mandates for energy alternatives. God's given us everything we need right under our feet. It is a reset from a humanity-centered planet to a planet-centered humanity. Worship Mother Earth. It is a reset from national currencies to a global digital currency. It is a reset from dietary freedom to government-dictated menus. Where they want you to eat crickets instead of cows. I'm telling you the truth. Because cows... You know what cows do. Now, personally, I didn't know cows did that, but the, the global elitists tell us that cows pass gas. <laughs> and because the cows eat the grain and pass gas, the world temperature is escalating. 
Now, this is what I'm telling you. 50 years ago, would you have believed this? So they want you to eat crickets. They want you to eat bugs. This is all part of the reorder. You t- you, you just, let me tell you something. I don't care what they say, and I don't care what cows do. I'd rather eat something that moves than something that chirps any day. I'm going to tell you something. I want me, a, I want a sirloin. I want a ribeye. I want me a, I want a filet. I want a cowboy steak. Don't be telling me what I have to eat. These people have lost their ever-loving minds. They want you to go around eating bugs. This is, a, this is a reset from a respect for history to the radical revision of history. It's a reset from the sanctity of personal privacy to unlimited surveillance of everything. It's a reset from free scientific inquiry. You know what you learn in eighth grade? The scientific method. You propose a hypothesis. You conduct your research. And you either discredit, disprove, or validate your hypothesis. Throw that out the window. It's a reset from free scientific inquiry to the imposition of predetermined conclusions in the name of science. It's science because we're telling you it's science. And you better believe us says Dr. Fauci. And then it's a reset from law and order to anarchy and lawlessness. And I want to say finally, the reset that we are facing is a reset from free elections to the criminalizing of political opponents. Which means you strip people of the right to vote for whom they want to vote for by locking them up in jail. If you can't beat them, incarcerate them. That is a dangerous reset. And by the way, that is not a statement for or against anything currently going on. I'm just telling you, we're on a slippery slope in this country. A very slippery slope. But this is how I want to wrap it all up for this first installment. And that is that God will use that global reset to establish his kingdom. You see, God will use it. I don't like it. I'd like to press rewind in a lot of ways on the way things were, at least in in our saneness and normalcy. But God is going to use even the bizarre, the abnormal, the acceleration of the consolidated power, the forfeiture of the sovereignty of nations, and the complete violation of the privacy and sanctity of the individual. He's going to use all of it to set the stage like this theatrical curtain so that when the reset is at its height, the the curtains are going to split wide open and here will be Jesus coming onto the scene of planet Earth. And carrying it all out. As Daniel was recounting Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel described this image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen, and there was this stone that appeared to to have appeared from nowhere, and it was not hewn or chiseled or cut by human hands. So this huge boulder with no human origin but rather of supernatural and divine origin, this stone appears out of nowhere and crushes the feet and toes of clay and iron, which which means the first act of destruction is to bring down that revived Roman Empire under the Antichrist. Verse 34 of chapter 2, Daniel says, King, uh, O king, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and and broke them into pieces. This is what happens in Revelation 19 when Christ comes back. He completely obliterates the global alliance of nations at the valley of Megiddo in in the battle of Armageddon. He smites them with the fire of of his wrath. But he goes on to say that that stone crushed legs of iron the belly and thighs of bronze, the chest and arms of silver, the head of gold. In other words, in the vision, the stone not made with human hands 
crushes all vestiges of global Gentile power that is hostile to God. Even those that link back to times of antiquity. In verse 44 it says, In the days of these kings, speaking of those ten toes of the confederation, the God of heaven is going to come and set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. And it shall stand how long? Forever. There's no doubt about it. The only kingdom that will last forever is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. The stone not cut with human hands is Christ coming back to vanquish all global power. He will crush consolidated power. When he returns, he will overturn every ungodly global mandate. He will restore moral order. He will demand godly reverence. And he will unleash his wrath against every enemy of God, every enemy of the people of God, and every enemy of the word of God. It'll all be over when Jesus comes back. So I just want you to keep these things in mind. You see, when Jesus comes back, that's really the final reset. <laughs> Why? Because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And he will rule and reign over this planet. And there's a difference, I believe, if, if we're right on this, between the rapture, when the church is taken up to heaven, and the return when Christ actually plants his feet on the Mount of Olives and sets up shop to rule and reign over an earthly kingdom. There's a difference. Both are going to happen. And somebody asked me the other day, well, what if they happen at the same time? Let me tell you something. As long as we're with Jesus, who cares when it happens? We'll be with him and we'll never be separated ever, ever again. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you are on your throne. We worship and praise you. While the nations rage and while leaders who are enlightened and powerful mock and ridicule your sovereignty. Oh God, our faith is not shaken for we know whom we have believed. We thank you that there is an appointed time when in the midst of this reset of the global order, your son Jesus will come in all of his splendor, in all of his glory to establish his dominance and his reign and his rule. And we will cry hallelujah, hallelujah to our conquering Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my favorite part of the service to invite people to visit our decision room. I don't ever get tired of talking about it. It's directly behind the worship center. And you know what? If I didn't know Jesus and I heard something like all of this stuff, if you're a first-time guest and you're new to things of, of God, this might have been a little heavy for you, but you needed to hear it. You need to hear it. This is all going to happen. And if you've got Jesus, you'll have no reason to fear. Amen. Amen. You need Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. Don't wait until he comes in the clouds. Give him your heart now. You can do it. And our decision room is just the perfect place for that to happen. You say, well, what do I do? You just walk through the doors and you say these three words, I need Jesus. That's all you have to say. They'll take over from there. And then you may be here and... And, and you say, well, I don't know about a global reset, but I need a personal reset. <laughs> My life's falling apart. I don't know how I'm going to get through next week. You're sitting here and all this stuff's kind of gone over your head. You couldn't even hear me because of all the stuff swirling around in your mind that's waiting on you when you get outside. And maybe while you've been sitting here, your phone's been going off. You haven't even been able to get your mind off of the trials and pressures or the conflict, whatever it is that's going on in your heart. And you need somebody to tell you you're going to make it. Go to the decision room. Just say, I need somebody to pray with me. Can somebody just listen to what's on my heart? Is there a safe place that I can share my struggles and know somebody will love me and pray for me? That's the decision room. Folks, people go back there every week and pour their heart out, and it stays right there with someone who's prayed all week who works back there, who serves back there, Lord, let me help someone on Sunday. You could be that person they've prayed for all week long. So I encourage you, consider going to.
the decision room today. And if you're watching us online, we have a number we ask people to use to text Jesus. If God is speaking to your heart or you've got questions, troubles, concerns, or you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, text that number on the screen. Or if you're outside the states, you can use email. It won't cost you anything, and we'll correspond with you, but you get the conversation started. I sure hope you'll take us up on that. Well, folks, I believe we've had church today. God has blessed us. He's such a good and gracious God. I love you, and God bless you.